first time I've heard that song. Uh, I usually ride around in my truck with the radio off. Uh, and I'm usually talking to myself, so. But uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 16, and Pastor assigned this to us, as, and he, he assigned the, uh, the title, When the Manna Falls. If I had to respond to the title, I would say that when the manna falls, the eyes ought to look up. Not around, but look up. And we'll get to that as we go along in the message tonight. And so as we're in Exodus 16, as with everything, and Pastor often restates this every time, especially in the book of Exodus, all the things that happen, happen with more intended purpose than what you see on the surface. What you see expressed and done by God is always a picture of his salvation. I could also say on the flip side, what you see in response by Israel is more of a need like we have that we need that salvation in everything that we do and how we react, how we behave. And so as we go into this, this is another point that uh, Jesus himself makes commentary back to this. And so I have good authority, if you will, to make the link. It's very easy to do so. So when we're talking about the manna falling, let's set the context as we begin. And so uh, you're familiar with the story of Israel and salvation. In Exodus chapter 14, they have been redeemed from, the, from, the, from Egypt, if you will. They're on their way out. And uh, uh, the context that I'm going to say and use is it's the journey home. It's the journey that they're going home. It's been a long time coming, 430 years, if you will. But God told them that he would bring them back. And so this is the journey home. Now picture it this also, just to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the message, that we have come from a point of redemption, but we're not home yet. Because that's where the application for us is going to be. From your point of con- of redemption, you're on your journey home. They're on their journey home. So at the Exodus 14, just to bring it up to where we are in 16, we see the Red Sea and the passing through of the Red Sea and the destruction of the Egyptian army. The great deliverance of God, if you will, and all that God did with the ten plagues in Egypt and how he delivered with his strong right arm from slavery, from in bondage, and he redeems his people to himself. And then he brings them out. So if you understand, if you remember, if you go back and read, you know, as they're going along, and I'm going to make a point here in a moment, but they're coming to the Red Sea, and there's a reason why they went that way. And uh, besides just what, what you might see and think about with the Egyptian army, there was more reason to it. So they come through the Red Sea in Exodus 15 then is the song of deliverance and just praise to God. They're up and they're just praising the Lord for everything that he's done. It doesn't take long for them to change their tune, of course, from from praise to grumble. Uh, Sometimes we could do that in in a really skinny minute ourselves. But they go from, and so the context is, they go through the Red Sea, the redemption from Egypt, the song of deliverance and celebration. Now in Exodus 16, we're seeing them as they go into the wilderness, if you will, the wilderness of sin or the Sinai, the wilderness of Sinai. And now we're in the place, and we're going to read it, between Elim and Mount Sinai. But what is it that occurred right before they got to Elim? And uh, so as you remember, as they went through, Uh, the Red Sea there, and then they were three days' journey out, and what happened? There's no water. And so God brings them to some water, but it's it's not palatable. It's the the waters of Meribah, if you will. And so again, this isn't part of this sermon, but there's there's a tree applied. When the tree is applied, the waters are made well. It's cleansed. It's It's made fresh. It's palatable now. That's another sermon, another day. But we go from there, 
They get their water, and then they go another three days' journey, if you will, another journey from there, and they go to Elam, which has the 12 streams and the 70 date palms. There's plenty of water for all of them, much to eat, sweetness, and all that God has provided. Well, it doesn't take long after that, as you know, for us to change our tune. So we're in the between Elam and Mount Sinai now. Well, here's where Exodus 16 picks up the story. Um, if I were to look at Exodus 15, verses 22 to 27, and if you will look with me over there, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Boy, that's just like the cross, isn't it? And there he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. And he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Our Jehovah Rapha, if you will, is where it's shown in the scriptures. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. What a great time they had there, I'm sure. So now, here we come, and we come to Elam, and then they set out from Elam. And they set out from Elam on the, on the second month, 15th day. So that's where we see in verse 1 of chapter 16. They set out from Elam, and, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, or Sinai, which is be between Elam and Mount Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation and the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to continue reading. I'm going to do extensive reading right here just for us to be able to <clears throat> go ahead and set the whole sermon up. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. There that word again. Whether they or not, they'll walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. For he hears your grumblings against the Lord, and what, we, what are we that you would grumble against us? Moses said, This will happen. When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and a bread to full in the morning, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but they're against God, the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. They looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing fine as frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to another, What is it? Well, that's what manna means. What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. 
You'll take an omer apiece according to the number of persons, each of you, to, in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much, some gathered little. When they measured it with an omer, he, he who gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. And Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it till morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and they left some of us, some of left part of it until the morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Now, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each person. And when all the leaders of the congregation come and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord said. That's what he meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you'll boil. And all that is left over put aside and kept until morning. So they put it aside in, until morning and Moses had ordered. And it did not become foul, nor there was there any worm in it. And Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath. And to the Lord in that, today you will not find it in the field. Six days you'll gather it, but on the seventh the Sabbath, there will be none. And it came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep the commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you bread for two days. On the sixth day, remain every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. And so the people rested on the seventh day. That was a lot of reading. I'm sure, and that from there, I want to bring out two things. There are two focal verses that I want to point out that we're going to hit again as we go. Verse 4 and verse 12. Verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they're going to walk in my instruction. Verse 12, I've heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them and say, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Two very important purposes of which God was doing and causing to happen with the instance of this, of this bread. So as we go along, I want to go into the points to ponder. That'll be the next slide, Gary. Thank you. I want to think about it, and let's just look at the text again. Let's question what it is. And so I want to ask, when was the manna given? When did it start? All right? So it started on what? The 15th day of the second month. What did they eat before that? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> they must have had something, of course. But you see, a lot of times we have to come to a point of our real need before we understand what it is that we're really needing. But I would dare say, now I'm going to, I'm going to, this is just me, this conjecture on my part, if you will. There's a whole month. This is one month after they left. Now remember, why did I say one month? Well, because when they were in Egypt, when the Passover was started, right? When was the Passover started? When God started the Passover, he said, this is going to be the first month for you. And on the 10th day of this month, you'll set aside a lamb. And on the 14th day, you'll slay that lamb. And on the next day, you're, you're going home. So the 14th day was the Passover. The 15th day, they started their journey on the first month. So now we're in the 15th day of the second month. So there's a whole month has gone by now. So... I, I like to take conjecture sometimes and say, okay, what happened in the meantime? Now, of course, all this is just my own just injections in here, and it means nothing, but it wastes time. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I've got to give you your money's worth. So I would, I would just conjecture, you know, they're saying, we're going home. So some people be like me, say, well, I'm going to make ready. I've got, to, I've got to get ready. You know, if I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to make sure that I'm prepared for that journey. So I don't think any of them really traveled that road. 
But it was pretty common knowledge that the highway, the King's Highway, which would have been the, the most expeditious route to go back to the Canaan land, took about a two-week journey. Two weeks. So there were probably some people who were pretty, pretty astute, or so they thought, and they had their bag of feed. They had their bag of grain. They had whatever it is. So for a while, they subsided on what they had. But it ran out, didn't it? Because they didn't go by that way. Now there's a reason why they didn't go by that way. And the, the reason stated in Scripture in, in Exodus 12 is that God said is that I won't take them through the land of the Philistines because they might see war and they're not ready for that. They would turn back, they would, they would scatter. So what do we have? We have a, a chaotic group who are not at all doing anything together as a, as a working unit. They're just a bunch, a multitude in chaos, just going across the, I mean, they're just spread out, no rhyme or reason, anything that they're doing, they would, and so if something were to attack them, they have no idea how to respond. God knew that. He couldn't let them get there. God knew what would happen. That's why they went that way. But while he was planning for them to go that way, he was also planning to provide for them that way. See? So, and you, you might not have realized or remembered, I didn't, I had to go back and look. You know, God said they could not handle adversity along that road. It, they would wipe out. You understand that it was two years that they got to Sinai, and God while they were there, started organizing everything, remember? And the building of the tabernacle, and then he started setting the, the children of Israel up in their camps. Then he started setting them up and numbering them for, for war and preparing them and telling them how to go, starting to order everything and, so that it would work finely tuned, if you will. It took a while to do that. That's one of the reasons why we're there. But we went for a whole month now, and they're pretty, now it's time for them to get hungry. Because I would dare say they've just exhausted everything that they had. They are at the end of themselves. Sometimes you and I need to come to the end of ourselves before we really understand God's provision for us. You sometimes, you know, we... We like to take care of ourselves. We like to make sure that I'm, you know, God, I got this, but if I need you, I'll call you. No, it's not the way it works, you see. So when was it that the manna was given and it started? Well, it started on the 15th day of the second month, all right? When did it end? Well, it should have ended it on the 16th day because they were really kind of grumbling, weren't they? If it was me, they wouldn't eat anymore. <laughs> you go figure it out, you know. But that's not God. I'm not God. So, and, and you know that. When did it end? Well, we know that because of who he is, it did not end until they entered the promised land. Forty years. Forty years, faithfully, day after day. Six days, one day off. Six days, one day off. Were they deserving of it? Absolutely not. Are you and I deserving of what God's grace would give us? Absolutely not. When did it end? And you'll see that, you'll find that not only in, in verse 35 of chapter 16, but also in Joshua chapter 5. It tells you as soon as they got into that land, and there's more to say about that here in a moment, why did God provide the manna? Why did he provide it? Because they had a need. And his grace is sufficient for the need. Certainly not. Who and what was it for? Well, it was certainly for all of them to sustain them. But more than that, you remember verse 12 and verse 4? It was to test them and to show who he was. They hadn't yet figured out, after all that went on with Egypt, and we had to re rehearse that, 
Now all the plagues and everything that they saw, all the power that was displayed, the deliverance at the Red Sea, the destruction of the, Israel, of the Egyptian army, they still have a problem understanding who God is and that he's working for them. Was it sufficient, the manna? Yes, it was. Was it anything else needed? No, because it sustained them, didn't it? And if you'll go back and read the other texts, you know, they, their shoes didn't wear out. God cared for them. Now, they did die, but that was for a different reason. So, so was, was anything else needed? No. Was it abundant? Yes. Much abundance. Was there anything lacking? No. Was it satisfying? Yes. It was, the, the, the taste was out of this world. <laughs> the only way to explain it. <laughs> was it appreciated? I'd have to agree with Charles. No. It might have been day one, and maybe even day two. But then what? Yeah, they got tired of it. Why? Because they didn't realize what it was given for. They didn't realize how grace has provided. Mm. Boy, we do that too, don't we? Did it accomplish its purpose? Yes, it did, in a sense. It kept them alive. But it, and it tested them, but I dare say that they never came around to that verse 12, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. But that even though they didn't come around to it, he never failed in giving it. Did it accomplish? I would say yes. So now next slide is some of the facts and the truth about the manna, which we've already stated in some, is that it was very plentiful, wasn't it? It was all over the ground. You didn't have to go far to get what you needed. It was right there. It was plentiful. It was readily available. It was sufficient. It was sustaining for you. You didn't need anything else. It was sufficient for your needs. It was given because it was faithful. Not because they were faithful, but because he was faithful. It was faithfully given. Not because they were deserving of it, but because he's faithful. And it endured, as we stated, until they reached the promised land. Caveat there would be the journey is complete. They don't need this because what was the promise of the land? I'm bringing you into the land. That's what? Flows with milk and honey. Where you're going to be in houses that you didn't build, you're going to be eating the food that's coming out of the fields that you didn't grow or plant or or till, or do anything to it. It's all there waiting for you. Keep that in mind, because when you come to the application on your life, you're on your journey home. And between here and there, God's going to provide for you. And when you get there, what you're getting today, and need today from Him, you won't necessarily need there, will you? Because faith will become sight. It was given by grace and mercy. Given with purpose to test them and that they might know God. So let's go towards the, in, the interpretation and the application. To do this, let's go to John chapter 6 then. In John chapter 6, as I stated, Jesus himself, many people, many pastors, preachers, teachers, they all, always say the Bible is its best own commentary, and it is. And so to stay with the integrity of the Bible, I have it on good record here what this might mean. So let's go to John chapter 6. This is the Olivet Discourse, one of the greatest discourses of Christ himself about the bread of life. And I've written the verses there. I'm sure you can read them. <coughs> Let me read them to you. John 6, 32 and 33 said, Jesus said to them, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. <clears throat> Here's where it reflects upon what it did there, but that wasn't the real purpose. The real purpose and everything God did in Exodus pointed to the truth of Christ and salvation. It's, he is the bread of life. He's claiming to be the bread of life. He says in verses 48 through 50, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. So the true meaning of the manna wasn't in the wilderness just so you could eat for that day. The true meaning and purpose is found in that you might look and believe to who God was and live eternally, not live today or only for today. We're not to live only for today. We are to live for eternity and have that focus in mind. That was his purpose for giving it. He is. So the comparison is made to the man coming from heaven to give life, eternal life. He, Jesus, is the true source of life and being. He brings and sustains us until we reach the promise of God. I want to I bring that out just a little bit more. And we're going to do so when we get into the next panel. Next slide. We are to trust him each day. Each day. Walking in obedience to his word. Being fed, nourished by his word. Day by day being fed, being nourished by his spirit day by day, that you might truly have life each day. He didn't give it, and he, doesn't, he is not necessarily concerned only with your physical being. He is more concerned with your spiritual being. We are to be satisfied each day with his supply. Not lusting after what the world desires and its provisions. They wanted more, even after they got this. Now, he brought the quail, didn't he? He brought the quail in the night before the manna started. And, and Roger Carter, one time, is the one that pointed out to me, it happened twice. I, I didn't remember that. <laughs> but Roger ta told me, and it's true, that he brought quail upon them. This time in Exodus, he brought the quail. They came in and they just dropped, poof, right there. There you have it. They ate it. They were satisfied. What were they doing? They were complaining because they didn't have meat to eat like they did in Egypt. And then the next morning, he gave them bread. And then every morning, the bread, the bread, the bread. Now later on, they wanted meat again, right? They want the meat. They want the vegetables. They want this or that. The bread just, uh, we're sick of this. Why are they sick of it? You know, well, God brought the quail again, as Roger pointed out to me one time, and when they ate it, it made them sick. So they probably, that's enough of that. I don't want that anymore. I'll stick with the bread. But it didn't stop them from grumbling and complaining. So let's go to the, the next slide, if you will, uh, Gary, there. There's more to meditate on here. And, and we're going to be running this thing downhill now. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Very familiar verses to you, I'm sure. Because God, is, Jesus himself is teaching and, uh, and he's telling his disciples when you're praying, don't use meaningless words and repetition like the Gentiles do. They think they're going to be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray then in this way. And that's how it starts in verse 9. 
Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That verse right there means a whole lot more maybe than what we've been assigning it to. Because where is our bread? Jesus himself is the bread. And I believe this verse reflects back to that. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, of course, there are some translations that would include for yours is the kingdom of power and the glory now and forever. Some manuscripts included that. Give us this day. It's another time, another one of the, the gospel accounts says, to, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And, and basically it's the same, same verses, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me today what I need. Not what I lust for. Not what I would desire of the world. You see, give me, give me this day our daily bread. Help me to know today that in every day that your sufficient love and care. Give me my daily bread. Help me to realize in the morning when I get up, the first thing, let me come and realize and draw and gather in my daily bread that I might prepare myself for this day. Give me this day the assurance, if you will. Keep me from lusting after the things of the world. Let me have my focus so on you and you fill me with your spirit. You give me yourself today, the bread of life, that I don't have to lust after those other things that I don't have to think that I have a need or a want that's not being satisfied. Give me this day my daily bread. Keep me from wanting to go after all that other, all that other stuff. Keep me from the tempter's snare. More than just food for my belly. That's, I, I think there's a whole lot more in there when it says, and he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Because he said, I am the bread of life. And today I need him. And, and, and it'd be best for me that in the morning when I awake, that I get my serving for today. To carry me through that day. Now he didn't tell me to gather enough that I wouldn't have to come back for the rest of the week. Right? I'm supposed to go every day. And come to him every day for today's needs. Jesus said in another way, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. So keep me from having to lust after other things. Help me to live in such a way that I want nothing more than what you would give me. They wanted more, didn't they? They weren't satisfied. Is that the way we are sometimes? God, to I don't think you're dealing with right with me. I need more. I want more. I need to go to a place and I don't need to walk away from that place until I say, God, I'm satisfied that you are all I need. That today I have everything I need to live for today. My daily bread my reflection. May I be satisfied to know and be satisfied in your love for me today because I'm going to be beat up out there in the world. I'm going to face a lot of things out there. Help me to get ready today that I can be ready for that day. Help me to reflect each day that today I'm on a journey home and you're not lacking in anything for me that today I have enough to carry me in this journey. Now I understand, and we have many, as he said, in the list of his prayer list, there's many suffering, because life isn't going to be just satisfied, sit in the shade, is it? We're going to go through some very difficult days, but I pray that you're satisfied 
and pro provided for each day, given the sufficiency that only he could give for today. He's not going to give you tomorrow's portion today. You go back tomorrow for that portion. I want to, Lord, be knowing that you are with me on this journey. There's going to be times of need. There's going to be dry times walking through the desert walking through suffering and pain and sorrow and seeing it all around me. But I want to know that on that journey, there's, a, there's an ending place over there where the streams of abundance flow, where want will cease and abundance of your grace and mercy will be all I know, where every promise is going to be fulfilled and there'll be no want anymore of anything where the sufferings of this life will fade away Lord give us this day our daily bread on our journey home you I pray have been redeemed and that you're on your journey you've received the bread of life but do you go back and get another portion for today, each day? Do you take time to prepare yourself for that day? Is he sufficient for you, or do you believe he's lacking? Are you satisfied? Are you grateful for what he's done in your life and is doing in your life? Or are we more like those in Israel do we really trust him that was his purpose and it still is today he's wanting to know that you will be satisfied and that you'll trust him with your life and all that comes your way each day one day the journey is going to be complete you'll have house that you didn't build you'll have abundance that you didn't plant because he's already made the way. Sustained when we get there, do your life, does my life reflect a journey of faith that we might say, give me this day our daily bread.